What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Brandon, back with another edition of the Macro Insights Podcast. But first, before we get started, a little disclaimer. I am not a financial advisor, and the guest is not giving financial advice. So everything you hear on this podcast is strictly opinion and should not be taken as financial advice. We disclose if we have any holdings discussed in this podcast, and you should not be following us as financial advisors. You should discuss this with professionals before you get involved or invested. And as always, it's not financial advice. So please, please, please take this strictly as our opinions and for entertainment purposes only. Now let's get into the show. What's up, everybody? I'm back with another edition of the Macro Insights Podcast. But first, I'd like to thank my sponsor, Idaho Armored Vaults. That's goldsilvervault.com, where you can buy and sell all the precious metals that you possibly would want. They offer a bunch of various services. They've been started in 2008, and they're there to help you protect your financial assets and private property outside of the financial system from numerous risks, including systematic and counterparty. This is a uniquely vertigrated, uh, uh, vertically integrated structure, procures, transports, and stores, and provides extensive liquidity using the precious metals. So if you want to get into the precious metals market, hit up Idaho Armored Vaults at goldsilvervault.com and tell them Green Candle sent you. And if you're watching this on YouTube or in audio, uh, YouTube, please hit that like button and hit that subscribe. Help me grow the subscribers of the YouTube and like the video to help me bring on awesome guests who will always be excited to come on the show and talk. Just like what I've got here, I got Justin, who uh, recently published a book um, call, about called Solving the Price is Right, excuse me. And so, uh, Justin, yeah, how may, hey man, how's it going? Good. Good to be on your uh, podcast, Brandon, Green Candle. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, you also go by Pop Culture Math on Twitter. So everybody go give him a follow and check him out there as well. So I'm glad we can connect. And uh, yeah, man, I'm excited to dive into it. But for those who don't know anything about you, or maybe haven't heard you speak on Twitter spaces or anything like that, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. So professionally, I've been a analyst and portfolio manager in the equity world uh, for close to 20 years uh, after graduating business school from Wharton in 2005. Uh, before business school, I was uh, in management consultant. Cons I was a management consultant for about four years. And that actually um, got me into investing during the internet 1.0 bubble and then picking up some of the uh, fallen pieces from the internet 1.0 bubble back in 2001, 2003. So I started investing my own um, back then, decided I want to go to business school to make a career change into um, the investment management world and being an equity research analyst and was able to do that. And so I've been in the industry for the last 18 years, uh, the last 10 years at a value manager uh, called Gamco Investors in Rye, New York. For the five years before that, I was at a global growth firm um, and so I've been exposed to multiple styles of investing. But the book was actually an idea back from my college days. Um, I studied economics and math in college and was very motivated by the subject matter. I came very close to applying to graduate school in economics to get a PhD and focus on game theory. And I chose to go into management consulting instead to see what the business world had to offer. And I never turned back. But there was part of me that always wanted to contribute something uh, to the sort of academic realm, to the study of game theory, and in a way that could be, you know, absorbed by the broader, um, you know, populace. And so I had this idea a year or two after college, um, actually when I was down uh, living in your neck of the woods in Florida, uh, to write a book on the math and the game theory underlying the Price is Right game show. And I was between jobs briefly in the year 2001. I had tried to start an online travel company uh, during the internet 1.0 era and moved down to Florida to do that. 
right as the market started to fall away from the peak. And so after we wound down that company, you know, only about six to nine months into its existence, I had some time in my hands. So I started writing this book or working through some of the, the problems. I was recording episodes on my VHS, my old tape, videotapes, and I got employed, fortunately, better, quicker than I thought. So the idea was effectively tabled until 2019, at which point I realized that on CBS All Access, I could easily watch episodes for a whole season, and uh, they would basically build up those episodes for the whole season until the season finished, and they would zero them out for the next season. So I subscribed to CBS All Access. I started watching episodes, and then I started working through some of the problems I had worked on 18 years ago, and I gained some momentum, and that momentum uh, continued as we got into COVID, and um, you know, I watched season 47 from September 2018 to June 2019, and then I watched season 48 from September 2019 to June 2020, 356 episodes in total, very significant data set, and I wrote at the library, and you know, COVID gave me more time to work on it, also made it harder to bring a book to market because everyone else was trying to write books during the COVID, but I was fortunate to find a really good literary agent who specializes in well-researched nonfiction. And he was fortunate to find a publisher, Prometheus Books, that has been publishing you know, a book every six months or so in the realm of popularizing math. So my book slotted pretty well into that. So that's, you know, what got me to sort of today with my book having been published in March 15th by Prometheus Books. And I encourage you to check it out. It's available online at Amazon and Barnes and Noble, as well as in some bookstores. And I also have, as uh, you mentioned, a uh, Twitter handle, Pop Culture Math, and a literary website, popculturemath.com, with some, some blog entries of my own. Yeah, and I'll be sure to link all of that in the show notes. So be sure to check it out because, uh, all right, but first I got to get into the just, you know, you talked about, you you glanced over it a little bit about how many episodes, uh, you know, the price of right that, that you watched. But all right, so so l- let me make sure I get the details right. You watched two full seasons and that's over 100 episodes in total. And each episode is about 30 minutes. Is that, is that right? Yeah, it's, um, when you watch on television, it's an hour. Okay. But there's a lot of commercials, so that quickly takes it down to about 40 minutes. And then there's some gaps. So if you know if you get CBS All Access without commercials and you sort of get it down to a science, you can do it in about 35 minutes an episode. There are some you know, days I would basically take the day off work and I would just binge watch like 14 episodes. That actually wasn't my ideal way of doing it because it became a little bit um just mind numbing and then there were times when i like i grew up in dc i took the train down to dc my high school reunion and watched you know six episodes on the train ride down six episodes on the way back but yeah 356 episodes it was 189 in season 47 and i think 150 167 in season 48 that season was a little bit shortened by covid i think the normal season's close to 200 episodes Yeah. So then you collected all this data just by, you know, simply, like you said, watching the episodes and then uh, just manually recording it and and everything like that. Um, But uh, yeah, is that right? I guess just obviously there's not not a big data set other than than what you you put together here of uh, the price is right, I'm guessing. Right. Well, actually, there are a lot of um, huge fans of the show and there's this website, TPIR Stats, where they have all the stats from the Price is Right for like the last, I think it's like the last 15 seasons or so. It might even be a few more than that. Um, So after I wrote the book, there were some things I wanted to check based on other seasons of data, like some observations. So I went to TPIR stats and looked at, you know, other seasons. But I will say that watching all this shows myself gave me a degree of like familiarity and insights that just looking at somebody else's data would have been hard to have uh, made as much with as I did by watching the episodes. Yeah, there's a, it, it is interesting because there's always like, you know, the numbers can say something, but it's really the, the art of the analysis behind it. Um, so uh, outside of, uh, I guess, just, uh, you know, loving the prices, right. And kind of been interesting, uh, interested into human behavior behind the analysis 
you know, I guess what was the, the real motivation? Like, what did you kind of expect or want to get out of writing this book? Uh, and did you get what you expected out of writing this book or did you get something completely different that you didn't anticipate when you started uh, going down this journey? Yeah, no, I did get most of what I want to get out of writing um, this book. So the, the goal, as I started to allude to, it was really a consolation prize to myself for not going down the academic path. It was the opportunity to you know, make a contribution in the world of math and game theory, you know, to the world at large, but there are a lot of, you know, observations in the book that academics, I think, will will feast over as well. And so that was the primary goal. And the second was just to sort of share my love of math and game theory with the world and just show, you know, how much there is to be gained in life by applying, you know, relatively basic math to everyday situations. And it's informed, you know, my experience and my skill set and how I stand out as an investor as well. Just looking at all the data that's out there, not just the financial data, but some of the operational data that companies report, some of the market and competitive data that, you know, may not even be officially reported, but you can estimate it. It's just sort of core to how I think about the world. And this book is sort of that skill set on steroids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it is interesting because it like, you know, in the first chapter, even you line out, um, uh, you lie out, line out like your key observations and you have seven, um, you know, seven different uh, observations that you kind of, uh, you know, outline throughout the entirety of the data set. And then you dive deeper into it, obviously. But uh, the first one is the underbidding bias. And I kind of want to get into that because, um, you know, you, you kind of relate it to like, you know, business, finance and markets and everything like that. You know, we were talking a little bit pre-show. It is earning season. Um, and it seems like, uh, you know, obviously earnings are you know, obviously so, somewhat of an analyst that an internal analyst that, you know, projects how much earnings a, a certain company or publicly traded company should be making for each quarter and kind of uh, basing their projections off of that. And then it seems like the market reacts one way or the other based on, you know, however this analyst uh, kind of, uh, I guess, projects. So in, in a sense, and with all that being said, uh, do you think that there's, I guess, like this kind of like underbidding, um, I guess, bias when it comes to not only just like, uh, you know, the things that comes are coming around and the price is right, but, you know, whether, whether it's expectations for revenue or all these other kind of things, or do you think that, um, you know, uh, these analysts or when it, when it comes to earning situations and other things like that, that people are, I guess, more dead on, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I never really thought that much about the linkage between underbidding on the price is right and analysts, you know, tending to forecast quarterly earnings on the low side. Um, you know, I think that quarterly earnings estimates are more a function of managements and their investor relations leads trying to talk down analysts, uh, publishing analysts, so that their numbers, you know, give managements uh, the leeway to sort of under promise and over deliver. I guess the flip side of it is that, you know, if you look at sell side consensus estimates for companies earnings, while they tend to be beaten, you know, in individual quarters for annual forecasts, they tend to come down as we get closer in. So as we get into, for example, 2023, you know, they start at a certain number. And then by the time 2023 is over, those analyst forecasts will have come down. So for the full year, you actually see the reverse where the estimates are coming down. But for the quarters, the companies talk them down so that they beat. I will say that, you know, so just to describe what we see on the show, there's a significant under bias in contestants row bidding where contestants bid in sequential order on item up for bids and whoever's closest without going over wins. And there are a lot of different reasons for this underbidding bias. Uh, the most psychological of those is this fear of going over, which is somewhat, um, somewhat um, I guess, irrational because when you're bidding in contestants row, you should actually be willing to risk going over if it increases your chances 
of winning the bidding round, but you see the opposite. You see these contestants being very afraid of going over. And what that does is it sets up the final bidder to usually come in with the high bid and win the round. So the, you know, 40% of the time, um, the round, uh, sorry, 40, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, 53% of the time um, in contestants row bidding, the highest bid would win. And when the last bidder tabled the highest bid, he would win the contestants row bidding round 64% of the time. So that just goes to show you the degree of underbidding bias. And so the psychological factor was one, you know, piece, people were also unfamiliar with certain prizes. They were used to sale prices. Um, you know, if there are multiple items that were part of the, uh, you know, prize that be, was being put up for bid, people would often, you know, quickly estimate the whole without adding it up on a piecemeal basis. So there are all sorts of other reasons, but just to focus on the one with the real world relevance, which is the psychological one, this fear of going over. You know, if we look over the course of, you know, economic history or modern economic history, particularly the last 20 or 30 years, you know, we see that the Federal Reserve has erred on the side of keeping interest rates too low. And there are actually a lot of analogies with contestants row bidding, because just like contestants don't want to disqualify themselves from having their bid reviewed by, you know, potentially going over, even if it increases their chances of winning that round of bidding, the Federal Reserve doesn't want to cause a recession by raising interest rates too fast um, or too far. You know, they'd rather not be blamed for causing a recession, even if monetary policy would be more effective if it was tighter and actually created a larger risk of causing a recession, but in return avoided some of these inflationary periods like we're seeing now or some of these stock market bubbles like we saw in the past. So it's actually, uh, you know, an interesting thing to think about this analogy. And the games are both very similar in the sense that, you know, in contestants row bidding, you should bid somewhat on the conservative side because, you know, the game is to be closest to the actual price without going over. Um, contestants just go too far in that direction. And same for the Fed. You know, most people would agree that the Fed is better off, you know, on the margin having interest rates too low versus having interest rates too high because, you know, severe recessions are generally worse than inflationary bouts. So that's, it's a really interesting thing to think about. I don't know if um, it's, it's, you know, perfectly analogous, uh, but in both cases, there's like an asymmetry in the game. In both cases, you know, the decision maker is, underbidding. And then, you know, what ends up happening is they get to the end of the show and the price is right. And then that last bidding round, interestingly, you see contestants getting much more aggressive with their bidding. It's almost like they snap into shape and they're like, wow, I only have one more chance to get out of contestants row. I better not uh, underbid like I was underbidding before. And similarly, the Fed, you know, they reach a point where their back's against the wall. You know, the market is, you know, going up too fast, or, you know, right now the market's not going up too fast, but inflation's going up too fast. And they're sort of forced to tighten because they've kept things too loose for too long. So interesting to think about. Yeah, very interesting to say the least. And it, it is pretty similar, you know, uh, I guess the way you laid it out there that the Fed, you know, essentially was right, keeping, uh, you know, interest rates so low, but um, you know, I, I guess uh, that kind of leads me to like 2019, uh, kind of thinking about that time, because, you know, from, I guess, the general perspective, a lot of people, when they talk about the decade from, you know, 2010 to 2020, uh, they think that the market was just simply going up and interest rates were at zero the entire time. But there was a period in time where the Fed attempted to raise rates for a second, um, and it seemed like the market took a turn and uh, the Fed quickly reversed course, um, you know, following that. Um, so do you think that there's any, I guess, kind of, uh, you know, similarities to what you would see during the show? Like maybe uh, somebody would kind of come out the gates a little hot and then uh, immediately kind of like revert to, uh, you know, maybe more of like underbidding uh, to, as they got, um, you know, down the line. Was there kind of something that you observed that way where, you know, depending on how uh, their first couple bids went, maybe it changed their behavior later on? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I didn't... Um... 
look into that in terms of looking at contestants, you know, that might have underbid excessively early on. And then if they didn't get out of contestants row, started to get a little bit more aggressive in their bidding. That'd be an interesting thing to follow up on. Um, you know, my personal view is that, you know, the Fed under Jerome Powell has sort of swung from one extreme to the other multiple times. Um, and that hasn't necessarily been the most effective way to manage monetary policy to go from being too loose to being too tight to being too loose and now potentially being too tight again. I think a lot of people, you know, wonder if this last interest rate increase was was needed, including myself. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, we'll, we'll see how it all ends up playing out. I mean, at this point, um, you know, it, it seems like uh, that the higher for longer uh, kind of mantra from the Fed has kind of has kind of continued. But I want to get into how, uh, you know, you believe that or how you wrote into the, the solving the prices, right? How, you know, the, I guess, game theory and human behavior kind of, uh, you know, relates to business and finance. So, sure. so let's go into that. Yeah. So there's so many sort of areas um, that one can talk about more, more microeconomic than macroeconomic, but to continue with contestants row bidding, uh, since that's what we've been talking about. Um, and just before doing that, stepping back one second, I would actually say that, you know, when you look at the underperformance of contestants on the show versus what they could have achieved while the book was initiated with a focus on the math and the game theory, and there's a lot of you know interesting math and game theory insights in the book, you know, two thirds of the contestants' underperformance was probably due to behavioral shortfalls, while one third of it was due to you know not being able to optimize the math and the game theory. So you know, it's really the behavioral side where we end up coming short, like being an expert. Uh, mathematical thinker is, is sort of the icing on the cake, but if you can correct the behavioral biases, you really, you know, get very close to operating at a good level. So in contestants row bidding, you know, the two other shortcomings besides underbidding were uh, anchoring, which we see all the time in the stock market. I mean, the typical example is um, someone, you know, they buy a stock, it goes down, they don't want to sell it until it gets back to their purchase price, which is a complete arbitrary anchor. But we also see it with, um, you know, particularly in the world we're in now with a lot of algorithmic trading, you know, we tend to see stocks that are sort of stuck at low multiples and are trading inexpensively and stocks that are stuck at expensive multiples and trading expense expensively. And we see that for extended periods of time now, which I think the algos probably are partially behind. And, you know, if you can break that anchor and you can find an opportunity for a company that's undervalued, you know, that has a positive catalyst, maybe it's a cyclical company whose business mix has changed. And it's become less cyclical. You know, that can lead to a positive re-rating for the stock. And, um, you know, conversely, if you find a company that's expensive because it's been outgrowing its competitive set, you know, pretty significantly and that outgrowth is slowing, then, you know, that expensive multiple can derate. So those are anchors um, in terms of stock market multiples for specific companies. On the show where we typically see anchoring is, you know, the first contestant bid in contestants row underbids, and then the second and third contestants just sort of follow that first contestant low, which makes it even easier for the fourth contestant to come in and just, you know, clip the highest of the three bids, typically by $1 going $1 above the highest three bids, and then, you know, win, you know, almost all the time, you know, 65% of the time that fourth bidder would win with the highest bid. So, you know, that was the anchoring, and there were some neat ways of testing running some statistics to show the degree of anchoring contestants row bidding. But, you know, one way that you could quickly sort of observe its impact is there was a much larger than normal number of situations where zero contestants would overbid and a much larger or a somewhat larger than uh, expected number of situations where uh, three of the four contestants would, would overbid. Um, so effectively, 
if all the contestants are underbidding, you know, a large percentage of the time, it shows this sort of anchoring low effect. And if three of the four contestants are, you know, overbidding more than you would expect, um, then it shows that the anchoring can also sometimes work in the opposite direction. So that was one interesting uh, observation. And then another um, observation, which is more on sort of the mathematical game theory side, is this notion of broadening your bid. So when you're trying to win in contestants row bidding, your goal is to get a bid that, you know, basically gives you the largest portion of the number line that you can claim to effectively try and win that item up for bids. So, you know, if you see an item up for bids and you're thinking that that price is between $800 and $1,200, you're better off being able to place a bid that hopefully allows you to win over a $200 price range than you are over a $100 price range. And so that notion of broadening your bid is very relevant in multiple facets of life, including investing. So if you think about NCAA college basketball pools, there's definitely a benefit to picking a third or fourth seed to win the tournament versus picking a first or second seed, since that's what almost every other um, you know, a, a contestant in the pool will do. You know, If you're applying to, to college or graduate school, it's very important to distinguish yourself beyond your GPA and test scores with extracurricular activities and leadership activities because, you know, good GPA and test scores are a dime a dozen, particularly, you know, with the degree of grade inflation and, and test score inflation that we've seen. And then in business and finance, um, you know, I think there's a tendency to try and look at all the data, sorry, to look at the data that everybody else is looking at and try and analyze it better. But if you can actually look at data that other people aren't looking at, whether it's macro or company specific, and you can build a story around that data that others aren't aware of, you're effectively broadening your approach and sort of breaking free from the consensus and the herd and coming up with a differentiated point of view. I mean, that's what I try and do as an analyst and portfolio manager. And, you know, it's somewhat analogous to the notion of broadening one's bid. Yeah, it's interesting that you're uh, the, the way you look at it that way, because, um, you know, you're talking about looking at, you know, I guess different kinds of data compared to w what's necessarily out there, you know, what other people are looking at. But it seems like, you know, in the age of information, um, you know, almost all that data is kind of like you know, publicly out there at this point. So, um, you know, you don't have to give us a full like bread and butter, but, um, you know, it seems like there's almost like kind of a maybe it's maybe it's a bubble that I put myself in on, on fin twit or something else and, and all these places that I'm looking but um, you know wh whether it's uh, you know stock evaluations kind of what's going on there so um, I, I guess what are some of the things that you do personally to you know uh, you know I, I guess uh, if you can divulge a little bit of uh, you know to make yourself differentiate um, because you know like you said there is like some aspect of differentiation when it came to guessing and the price is right, like if you if you have all the information that everybody else does, but you're able to kind of, uh, you know, whether it's go a little bit higher or, you know, uh, overbid or uh, kind of be a little bit more aggressive, you have a higher percent chance of winning. So, you know, in the stock market, how are you kind of applying that, uh, I guess, game theory in a sense? Yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, comes down to my viewpoint that the stock market is relatively efficient. And unless you have a differentiated viewpoint and that differentiated viewpoint can be, you know, constructed in a value investing context, it can be constructed in a growth investing context, in a macro context, in a, text, in a technical context. But unless you have a different, somewhat differentiated viewpoint, it's, it's hard to sort of beat the market. So, you know, one of the things that I've found to be effective um, in picking stocks in a value investing context, which is where I focus, is to look at a company's competitive set. And a lot of people look at companies' competitors and evaluate companies versus their competitors like they should. But if you look at opportunities where you have companies with very weak competitors, it presents a very good setup to invest in a company. Uh, and conversely, if you avoid situations with companies that have very strong competitors, 
you know, those are situations you may want to avoid. It might be a really good company, but the competitive set's really strong. And a lot of these situations are situations that, um, you know, we can observe in our day to day life. So, you know, one great example, just looking back over the last five years, and this isn't meant to be stock advice or a stock pick today. I mean, look at the wireless world and look at how much market share T-Mobile has taken from AT&T over the last five years, and maybe a little bit from Verizon as well. AT&T is a really poorly run company and a really poor, poorly operated wireless provider. And here you have T-Mobile, you know, rebranding itself, providing unlimited data. I mean, doing stuff that is not rocket science. And yeah, those are great things, but... I can assure you that, you know, the success of T-Mobile stock over the last five years relates as much to having AT&T be a, a subscriber donor virtually every quarter than it does to the things that T-Mobile are doing correct. Yeah. And I mean, uh, that, that's a great breakdown and a, a little tidbit. And obviously it's not financial advice or anything like that, but that's just an example of, uh, you know, some of the game theory that plays out. So, um, you know, you've kind of gone into how it goes into like the investing aspect of it, which is a little bit more on the, the finance side. Uh, you know, how do you think, I guess, the, the, I guess the game theory that you observed in The Price is Right maybe uh, operates I guess on, on the flip side of things, like more of operating a business, kind of like the human behavior behind that. Is there any like key observations that you took away uh, from the prices, right? That you can kind of see when you're like analyzing these companies, whether it's like a CEO or how it's run or anything like, along those lines? Yeah. So the, the best example is a notion that I call strategic patience. And there are three pricing games on the prices, right? The range game the card game and that's too much where you effectively are trying to guess the price of a prize or a car and you're waiting for the price to advance somehow. So in the range finder, it's a range that goes from the lower bound to the upper bound. You stop it somewhere in the middle where you think the price falls within the range of the range finder and that's too much. You have um, 10, sort of prices and you have to start at the lowest price and work your way up. And when you see the price that you think is the first price that's greater than the price of the car that you're trying to win, you have to yell out that's too much. And if you pick the right price, you win. And in both games, you know, range games and easy game, it had a high win rate. That's too much as a hard game. It had a low win rate, but you know, most of the losses occurred because the contestants stopped too soon. And there was basically anxiety associated with waiting for the price to go to the level that they wanted to get to. And that's quite relevant in personal finance as well as business decisions CEOs make. So if you think about buying a house, you know, if you're in a balanced housing market, um, we're not always in a balanced housing market, but if you're in a relatively balanced housing market and you see a property that goes on the market that you like and you're not in a rush to move, your best bet is to wait a month or two because the seller will inevitably lower the price. And so why start negotiating on the initial list price when you can negotiate on a lower list price that might be five to 10% lower in a month or two? You know, if you're worried you're going to lose the place, um, you just let the selling realtor know about your interest and they can alert you if somebody else, you know, shows up. Um, and that's what we did when we bought our second house and that worked out very well. Um, and we, you know, obviously wanted to act sooner. We were worried it would disappear, but we were patient and then we got a much better deal. So in the world of business, you know, you see all sorts of situations where companies want to buy other companies and they're worried that somebody else is going to succeed in beating them to the punch. And so they'll go in and sometimes, you know, the seller will tell the potential buyer like, hey, I'll sell you this company for you know, a billion dollars if you meet my ask. Otherwise, I'm going to go and put this company up for auction. And so a lot of buyers, they sort of, you know, start to have FOMO, they start to have anxiety, and they go in, they meet the seller's ask, and they come up with whatever justification they need to come up with, 
you know, for the rest of the management team or for the board, it usually ends up backfiring because they pay too much. So the steel company Nucor last year bought CHI Overhead Doors, which is the third largest garage door maker. And they were buying it from a very smart seller, KKR, a private equity firm. And they met the seller's ask in its entirety, um, which was, you know, a fairly expensive multiple on, you know, definitely peak margins and, and maybe peak revenues as well. And, you know, the seller got like an amazing, you know, price for this business. And, you know, the buyer, they could have waited. Interest rates were going up. Demand for housing related things was going down. It wasn't even clear who else would be interested in buying this property. And I can, you know, be pretty certain that if they had waited a few months, they could have bought this asset for 10 to 15% less, nor was it necessarily a need to have for Nucor. I mean, their principal business is steel. They have some construction related products, which this falls into. But, you know, if they didn't win this property, it wasn't, you know, going to set them back strategically. So, you know, we all suffer from strategic patience. I think it's probably one of those sort of anxiety um you know, elements of human behavior that, you know, is very observable on the show. Yeah. And it's interesting that you brought up like the housing market, because I don't think like, uh, well, maybe not now. So we'll, we'll get a little back to that, but in the past uh, two years ish, we haven't really seen that strategic patience really play out. I mean, we saw, you know, a lot of people uh, you know, overbidding from housing in Texas, Tennessee, Florida, even, and, and a lot of these places where people are kind of flocking to. Um, and just, you know, anecdotally, I heard a lot of people purchasing homes like 50 to 100,000, maybe even more over asking price. Uh, so do you think like we're going to kind of get back to I mean, uh, you know, obviously, I'm not asking you to make a full on prediction, but uh, is that, you know, kind of an element of, uh, I guess maybe that, that can uh, allow people to get a little bit more savvy when it comes to maybe purchasing or buying the, their first homes as we're seeing interest rates get higher. And a lot of, uh, I guess, you know, uncertainty when it comes to, you know, not only uh, the housing market, but essentially like all markets, it seems. Yeah, no, I mean, we're definitely not haven't been in the balanced housing market for a while. Um, you know, interest rates were low. Then there was an exodus during to the su suburbs during covid you know, the housing market's been underbuilt, but I, I think we'll return to a balanced, you know, housing market at some point. I, I don't mean to digress and provide my views on the housing market, but <laughs> I think it's one of those markets where if you compare the U.S. to the rest of the world, people tend to focus on the fact that our housing market is, is underbuilt, um, you know, on a single family home basis relative to, you know, whatever the number of households or new households. When you look on a square foot per capita basis, um, you know, we definitely have a lot more square foot per capita than the rest of the world, whether it's in a single family home or an apartment. And, you know, if interest rates stay high and the economy sort of goes sideways, I can assure you people will find out, find that there are ways to, you know, have lodging without occupying or, or owning their own single family home. Yeah, I didn't mean to to kind of diverge the conversation of that, but that just kind of sparked the thought in there uh, when you when you brought that up. But uh, I kind of want to get into almost like the I, I'm not sure, uh, you know, I guess how else, else to describe it, but almost like the group think theory, so to speak, where, you know, when it comes to this bidding, um, you know, did you notice something or observe something that, uh, you know, depending on how the, the first bidder bid, uh, I guess, you know, whether it was under, over, what have you, that. Uh, I guess the strategy, so to speak, around that would change or kind of affect on how the, you know, second, third, fourth kind of better uh, bid. Because, I mean, I know you said that there was like an underbidding, um, you know, phenomenon at the beginning and that the last bidder, you know, if they essentially overbid everybody else, they they had a, you know, 64 percent chance to win. So was there something that you kind of saw that, you know, even though the I guess the first better maybe they bet 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, dollars uh, less that nobody really got close to the final price because, um, you know, the first person undershot significantly or the, uh, you know, the second person went swung one way. So the other person swung the other way, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, no, I mean, in the book, I lay out examples of bad bidding behavior and I lay out examples of good bidding behavior. And there are really too many cases to go into. But what you tended to see was this, you know, initial underbid by the first bidder 
And then that would anchor the second and the third bidders low. And then the fourth bidder would come in and clip one of the prior bids, usually the highest of the bids, and go $1 higher. So that was the most observed bidding pattern. I mean, strategically, what you should see is you should see that if the first bidder goes low, the second bidder should come in and take the high sort of portion of the number line that the first bidder should have taken. So if you actually get into like the game theory dynamics and you think of a simplified game where four people in a row are picking sort of a random number between one and a hundred um, and whoever is closest without going over wins and everyone, you know, it's sort of like a uniform distribution. So the number is sort of equally likely to be anywhere between, you know, zero and a hundred. What should actually happen is the first bidder um, should bid high like 78 and the second bidder should bid like 56 and the third bidder should bid 34 and that will force the fourth bidder to, you know, bid a dollar and sort of capture a third of the chance of winning if the price or the number falls between one and 34. And the reason is, is because you're effectively as, since you're as an earlier bidder, you have to watch out for one of the later bidders coming along and clipping you. And the best way to do that is to go high. So you're effectively self-limiting the portion, you know, of the number line that you can win over and you, you force the other bidders low. But yeah, so that's, that, that's sort of the game theory. And there's definitely some uh, more nuanced discussion of the game theory uh, in the book. But, um, you know, I, I know we were discussing some of the biases uh, that contestants have on the show. And there's one that I have to get into, which is another form of anxiety, if I may. Yeah, um, we haven't discussed the showcase and, you know, I'm sure most listeners are familiar with the showcase and the price is right. Each contestant gets to bid on a set of unique prizes. The closest, you know, contestant in terms of bidding on the price of their showcase without going over wins, you know, his or her showcase. If both contestants go over, neither uh, wins their showcase. And, what I found, which really startled me, like it startled me so much that I didn't believe the numbers at first, is that the first showcase wins 53% of the time, the second showcase wins 41% of the time, and the third showcase, or sorry, not third showcase, <laughs> and 6% of the time, both contestants would go over and neither uh, contestant would win. And if you think about it, the second showcase should have a higher win rate than the first showcase because if the second, the bidder on the second showcase observes a really good bid on the first showcase. He can, you know, bid tighter or more aggressively to what he thinks the price is. And if he observes a really weak bid, like if he thinks the first showcase bid has gone meaningfully over, he could literally just bid a dollar on a second showcase. Uh, but you don't see that. And so what ends up happening is that the second showcase ends up underperforming because too much of the time the bidder on the second showcase goes over. Um, and it's particularly true for, you know, second showcases that are lower priced. But in general, the second bidder gets anxiety after witnessing the bid on the first showcase and ends up bidding too aggressively and goes over uh, way too much of the time. And that effectively prevents the second showcase from doing as well. So the second showcase actually um, led to overbids 30% um, of the time. And that basically, you know, nullified any advantage associated with bidding on the second showcase and then some. And if interestingly, it wasn't actually tied, that overbidding uh, on the second showcase wasn't actually tied to whether or not the bid on the first showcase was good. It was just the second bidder got anxiety and went over. And so we actually see this outside of the show, and I call this the anxiety um, of going um, second, or I actually I call it the detriment of going second. And so we see it in soccer in penalty kick shootouts. So there was this professor at the London School of Economics who looked at you know sudden death situations in penalty kick shootout situations across thousands of penalty kick shootouts, and he found that the team going second only won the penalty kick shootout 40% of the time. They effectively got anxiety. They tried to, you know, go for too much on a shot. Maybe they went over the crossbar. Maybe they missed on the side. And whatever the case, you know, the anxiety or the detriment of going second 
uh, showed up in uh, penalty kick shootouts. And then sometimes we see it in job interviews as well. So, you know, you get down to the final round of a job interview. Maybe it's just two or three people interviewing for that role. Here, there's not necessarily someone going first or second, but you're, you know, keenly aware that you may be uh, competing with one or two other applicants. And there's this tendency to try and oversell yourself that sometimes can materialize uh, because, you know, you're worried about the strength of the other applicants. And by overselling yourself, you actually, you know, perhaps, you know, rub some of the, some people the wrong way and you don't end up getting the job. Um, so it's a similar phenomenon and it's a human anxiety or shortcoming or behavioral bias that, we see, um, you know, not just on the show. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't even really think about, uh, you know, I, I know we were talking a little pre-show about how you're you're relating it to, you know, business and finance. But, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, it's, it's all kind of uh, essentially, you know, related to, you know, sports and kind of every aspect of life, too. So um, I, I guess uh, outside of, you know, that maybe the second, you know, anxiety theory and maybe the underbidding phenomenon, um, you know, what was, I guess, your your biggest takeaway that you've kind of like, uh, I guess, observed now in your, your real life uh, after, you know, maybe watching the book or sorry, reading the book from uh, watching all these uh, stories? Has there, has there anything that maybe you've applied or, you know, maybe, uh, I guess, taken a note on that you maybe didn't really notice uh, previously before kind of taking this deep dive into the numbers? Yeah, I mean, I, I've always, um, you know, had an approach to investing, which has been try been focused on trying to discover um, important drivers, um, you know, that other investors aren't focused on. I've also tried to be attuned to situations, um, behavioral situations where the market can get too negative or too positive on a security, a sector, or even the overall market. So I guess um, I think in some ways watching the show has made me, um, you know, more aware of some of these biases because I've sort of cataloged them. Um, and, you know, it's not complete. There are all sorts of biases that we have that don't show up on the show. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I hope it makes me a better investor. We'll see. Um, it can't hurt. Um, I, I just think that, you know, knowing – you know, how to observe situations where their behavioral, you know, shortfalls among a large number of investors is, you know, a great way to beat the market. I don't think it's something that occurs every day or every week. Maybe it occurs a couple times a year. But, um, you know, another good example of sort of the herd was, you know, the sell-off in the in Meta stock um, at the end of last year. So clearly everyone was concerned that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg wouldn't cut costs and he'd continue to just throw away money and invest in the metaverse. But, um, you know, what made the sort of herd behavior, I mean, first off, the herd behavior was a little bit irrational because in theory, you know, Mark Zuckerberg should care about his own stock price and he should want to cut costs in the business, which he ultimately did. But there was something else that everybody missed, which if you look at the stock price of Meta, it bottomed almost exactly to the day that Elon Musk acquired Twitter. And as all of us know, and you and I are both, you know, lovers of Twitter, you know, the user engagement on Twitter has really fallen off since Elon Musk closed Twitter. Sorry, since Elon Musk closed the Twitter acquisition. Well, guess what? You know, Meta has put up better than expected revenue numbers for two quarters in a row. And you don't really hear this, but maybe some of that is coming from the decline user engagement on Twitter. And so, you know, here's an example where we can all see it because we all use these forms of social media. And yet um, this is something that, you know, the herd sort of was was not aware of. That was probably at play, at least on the on the revenue line, maybe not so much on the cost line. 
Yeah, that's pretty interesting that you bring up that example because, yeah, I mean, I haven't really, you know, being on Twitter all the time and listening to, you know, financial stuff on, from Twitter, I never really even even heard that. But I'm also, you know, I guess a meta bear, so to speak. So, uh, you, you know, I'm not I'm not looking to praise meta in any, in any aspect uh, because I I don't know, just that's another rabbit hole we could get down the line anyway. But um, it's interesting that you bring up the, like the, the kind of like the herd thing because. You know, it, it's you've kind of seen that, you know, thought process play out um, when it, whether it comes to, you know, GameStop, AMC, like a lot of these meme stocks, uh, you know, you, you get a lot of people, I guess, on board. And then, uh, you know, you see something kind of happen to that stock and then, you know, a bunch of people kind of want to FOMO into it. Uh, so is there anything that you kind of, uh, I guess, can relate to the game uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, maybe like the FOMO investing or kind of, uh, you know, I guess that that kind of like herd thinking mentality, so to speak? Yeah, no, I mean, the herd mentality is not as observed on the show because the contestants are, are um, acting individually. Um, and, and just by the way, you know, the investment examples I give are meant to be backward looking um, rather than anything, you know, perspective, including meta uh, where I think the, uh, you know, relative user engagement vis-a-vis -vis Twitter is, is probably more understood by the market today in any event. But yeah, no, there wasn't so much um, herd behavior on the show. One other interesting example, which relates to business, if I may, um, is this notion, which I think is really interesting, is this notion of sufficient for success. And it shows up in this game on the Price is Right called Hole in One or Two, where contestants are trying to win a car and they can basically putt from any number of six lines. The first line is farthest away. The sixth line is very close to the hole. And to putt from closer in, they have to rank grocery prizes from lowest, least expensive to most expensive. And however many grocery prizes they can consecutively rank from least expensive to most expensive before that pattern is broken, that's the line they putt from. So if they rank three price prizes correctly in a row, it doesn't have to be the least to the second least to the third least. It's just any three in kind of ascending order. They get three in ascending order. They putt from the third line instead of the first line. And so what all these contestants would try and do is they try and get like a perfect ranking where they ranked all six prizes in sequential order from least expensive to most expensive. Well, guess what? If you do that, you're likely to err early and end up putting from the first to the second line, which is what we observe. And so they basically did too much instead of focusing on what was sufficient for success, which is just find any three prizes, any three grocery items rather that you're pretty certain you know, one is less expensive than the second is less expensive than the third and just get those in order, putt from the third line. Chances are you'll get the putt in on the first or the second putt and win a car. And there are very few contestants that did that. Well, in business, there's this great example um, where Merck and Bristol Myers uh, going back, you know, close to 10 years um, were competing for the immuno oncology market to treat cancer. And, what happened was in 2016, Bristol Myers drug Opdivo had a huge advantage over Merck's drug Keytruda, 3.8 billion in sales to 1.4 billion in sales. But the pivotal trial was the pivotal trials were being run for the first line treatment of lung cancer. That was sort of the granddaddy of them all, solid state tumors. And they were each running respective trials. And there was this particular uh, biomarker that I guess suggested better efficacy for the drug. And Bristol Myers ignored the biomarker and said, we're gonna target the broadest patient population we can. And they ended up not meeting the endpoint of, of uh, improved overall survival, which is just, you know, how many years do you live after your initial cancer diagnosis? And Merck ended up running the trial on a smaller subset of patients that had this biomarker that suggested a positive reaction to the drug. And not only did they hit overall survival uh, success, but they hit it early and were able to st stop the trial early. And so this was 2016 when this started. Merck's drug 
was being outsold to over by more than two to one by Bristol Myers drug, 3.8 billion to 1.4 billion. And then if you fast forward to the present in 2020, you know, this line of treatment has just shown explosive growth and Merck's drug is, you know, doing over 14 billion of sales and Bristol Myers Optivo drug is doing 7 billion of sales because basically Merck figured out what was sufficient for success. They didn't overshoot. Bristol Myers did. And we don't know to this day, which, you know, drug is actually better than the other because the efficacy is very close, but the trials have shown Merck to have better data and it's become sort of the blockbuster and Bristol Myers drug and their stock, since this was their largest product, has sort of languished. So that's a final example I'll give you. I could give more examples, but uh, it's a fun one. And it's one that, you know, we see people, they just try to do too much, you know, whether it's they're starting a company instead of figuring out what product is needed, you know, to serve their customers' needs, they end up, you know, trying to create all sorts of bells and whistles and some you know, amazing technology, and then they run out of money for their startup. <laughs> yeah, that seems to happen all too much, unfortunately. But uh, Justin, you've been very kind with your time this afternoon or night, I guess. So we're recording this on Monday night, so I really appreciate you coming on. Um, so uh, outside of solving the prices right, which I'll put all of that in the show notes, um, why don't you tell people uh, where they can find you and uh, what else you got going on? Sure. So um as mentioned, um, I'm on Twitter at handles pop culture math, and I have a website and blog popculturemath.com. My book, Solving the Price is Right, is available on Amazon and all the other major online um, booksellers, as well as some bookstores. And, you know, I'm hoping to write another book in a few years, uh, but it was a very taxing experience. Um, took a lot out of me. It took a lot out of my wife, who was uh, my helpful copy editor. She's a trained accountant, which was a good skill set uh, to help edit my book. Um, yeah, but, you know, outside the book and, and you know, my day-to-day -day investing job, uh, you know, I'm, you know, active in, you know, Twitter still and, you know, Twitter spaces and love to discuss, you know, numbers, math, investing, and, and stocks. And, you uh, you know, always happy to engage with people like yourselves. It's just a lot of fun to share ideas. Yeah, awesome stuff. So everybody go check out Solving the Price is Right. Go check it out on Amazon. Go check out his uh, website. And uh, yeah, follow him on Twitter. Justin, thanks so much, man. Thanks so much, Green Candle. <laughs>